One thing that was very interesting to me, obviously I worked in the um, forensic pathology department at Sheffield at the Medical Legal Center, and then I also moved into epidemiology later on. It became of great interest to me, when did we start recording everybody's death, more or less, and why did we start doing it? What do we do with that information? So when it comes to documenting death, I think we can say fairly definitively that nobody has done it as well as the Egyptians. Um, this one dude with the Great Pyramid in, in Giza, he got his death extremely documented um, in, in a kind of project that would have taken decades to build. Uh, unfortunately for literally everybody else, we don't know too much about the people who built it, the conditions under which they built it, or how they did so. Let's say about 100,000 people worked on this, but we only know about the one guy, about Khufu and his pyramid. But it does open up this idea that while we think about documenting death now as something that obviously happens, you have a death certificate, this has just not always been the case. It just hasn't always been all that important to our societies who dies and why, unless you were very, very, very rich or had committed quite a lot of crime. This sort of starts to change in the British Isle with the medieval coroner system, and this is where I have to refer to my notes. Um, we have Alfred in about 871 or so having something that is called a coroner, but we don't really know from the historical records what that coroner was charged to do. But medieval coroners fully come in with a kind of Norman administration in the 1170s. When we think about a coroner now, we think about the person who determines the manner of death. That is how it's used in England and Wales now. So the, uh, the pathologist or doctor may give you the cause of death, put your dick in a toaster and electrocuted yourself, and the manner of death, I'm sorry, couldn't help it, the manner of death, misadventure. That's the coroner's job, to determine if a crime was committed. Back in medieval times, however, they're really much more of a glorified tax collector. And what that means is that if somebody dies and their body was unclaimed and you run across it, you must raise the hue and cry. And the reason why you do this is because the government wants to collect any bits that the dead person might have laid on the floor. Or if a crime was committed, they'd like to claim the dagger um, that killed you and sell it on to raise taxes. So to give an example, and this is a completely, this was not a real person, although I should point out, you can't libel the dead. So let's say, you know, Henry de Buckingham Clark died of a stab wound, value of knives, one shilling, 1327. And if any of you are on Twitter, there's an account called Medieval Death Bot that just basically tweets things like this automatically. Um, and if you're wondering, quite a lot of things, quite a lot of people get called Clark, uh, simply because it's anybody whose profession involves writing uh, including students. So you're thinking to yourself, like, why is somebody who works at the 7-Eleven going around and stabbing so many people? It's actually because the word had a much broader meaning then. Still, at the same time, we're only recording certain types of death for certain reasons. This kind of also falls out of use as the role of the coroner starts to change. The one that people know about, and the one that's really much more directly related to how we document death now, are the bills of mortality. The first ones are in 1592, and obviously we know what's going on around that time. A whole lot of people are dying really quickly because they're sticking their dicks in toasters, uh, <laughs> a.k.a. Plagues. Um, plagues are happening, and when a plague is active, let's say it's summertime and the plaguing is easy, um, everybody in the city is dying, a bill of mortality will be issued, and it lists by parish how many people died. Um, so in the city of London, I think there were 27 parishes within the city walls and like 12 outside or something like that. And you know, and you have, uh, oh, what were the other ones? Middlesex and Surrey, sorry, <laughs> my London geography is so poor. The, the bit that Oxford start on and the bit that Cambridge start on for the boat race. Um, so you have these occasional little bulletins that come out 
telling you how many people have died and where they have died, and the presumption being they probably died of the plague. Sometimes we also get their ages, but we don't get very much about who they are exactly. And when the plague season dies down again, we stop hearing about who's dead. You stop getting your little notebook. I don't know. Um, I, I've kind of got to the age now that I'm in my 40s. I actually do peruse various publications looking for people I know who might be dead. Um, and I, I understand uh, that this is something that takes up quite a lot of time as you get older, looking for people you know who might be dead. So I like to imagine somebody in this time kind of flipping through and going, ooh, 15 people in such and such parish died. I wonder if I know any of them. More importantly, did I dislike any of them? The bills of mortality, however, start to become a more permanent thing. And when they do this in 1603, the worshipful, com the worshipful company of parish clerks, people writing things down, um, start having a regular uh, bill that they are issuing with all the deaths. And in this, because it isn't always plague season and they're doing it all the time, they start to record what people died of. So again, we're not getting very much detail on the individuals themselves, apart from age, what killed them, and where they lived. But names aren't really attached to this in any way, in part because nobody's really collecting taxes off the dead at this point. Um, this is where we start to get into an interesting kind of situation uh, that continues on until about 1836, and there is an act that establishes the register of births, and deaths. And this is the progenitor of what we have today with births, marriages, and deaths. And now we start to have names attached. Now we start to have a bit more of biographical detail. And now everybody's got to be in it. Everybody. What this enables us to do as scientists is epidemiology. So this is the diagram from uh, John Snow, the 1854 cholera outbreak from the Broad Street water pump. At the time, it was thought that a lot of diseases, the theory of disease, was known as the miasma theory of disease. We didn't really have the infection theory of disease yet. People believed that illnesses kind of came in bad air, and that if you were particularly delicate, a child or an older person, you should stay in at night so that the bad air didn't get you. People develop this more and more. They say, oh, it's decaying organic matter that brings you any host of diseases. What Jon Snow was able to do, because he had a lot of detail of who had died, where they had lived, who they were, was go back to those places, go knock on some doors, and go ask, well, what were these people doing before they died? Where did they go? I want a detailed account of what happened. And that's how he was able to connect the outbreak of cholera to the specific water pump that almost everybody who died in this particular outbreak had used. This is where epidemiology begins. And the wonderful thing about epidemiology in this country is because we have such great documentation going forward, we can find out quite a lot, not just about who is dying, where and when they're dying, and the cause of their death, but also what causes the cause the etiology of disease. If we can start to put together factors from people's life course, we can start to understand a little bit more what might be the exposures that lead to particular kinds of cancers. And that's the area that I worked in for several years. We knew that there were thyroid cancers in the northeast of England. They were happening in particular spots. And we want to know what is the exposure or set of exposures the more information we have, the better this gets. Now, the brilliant thing about living in a country with the NHS is now we have so much of that information on databases. Um, there are data protection measures in place to make sure that we can't accidentally tell people, you know, your particular medical history, although, of course, that does get broken from time to time. When you go to other countries like the United States, where I live now, though, it's a completely different picture. There is not a national register. Things are state by state. Not only are things state by state, some states do not record these in any systematic way at all. So if I wanted to be in the state of, say, 
Nevada, and I wanted to look at childhood thyroid cancers again. I'm starting from ground zero. I would have to go to different cancer hospitals and start asking them for access to the data to put it together. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.